Well, good morning, Grace. I'm glad to be here with you this morning. My name is Keith. I'm the youth pastor here. And um, we are glad that you are joining us for week three of our series called Retold. And uh, before we jump in, just there's a, there's a connection card in the seat back in front of you. So if you could grab that even right now and start filling it out, it allows us to know how we can connect with you, how we can serve you. And then at the end of the service, then you can go ahead and put that in the offering basket. But if you have a prayer request, we would love to be praying for you during this time and just um, praying over you. Uh, or if you're just looking for your next step, then that's another great way to do that. There's uh, uh, boxes on there for next steps like baptism or Grace 101 or whatever that might be for you. Um, so go ahead and fill that out or you can fill it out during the message and then at the end of the sermon, then we're going to have offering and you can put that in the offering basket at that time. So the first week Tim Hayward kicked off uh, on Father's Day and he was talking about Abraham and Isaac and kind of looking at their story and kind of that main takeaway point that he had from that was that um, we know that we're able to trust God when we're willing to give anything up to him. When we're willing to give those things up to God, then we're able to trust him. Uh, Patrick, on last week, talked about Ruth. And he kind of walked through Ruth's story, and he walked through his own story. And as he did that, he helped us realize that even in the ordinary moments of our life, God is still at work. Even in the mundane, seemingly insignificant moments of our life, God is still doing something. And last week, as, as Patrick was talking, he mentioned uh, that Ruth was in the line of Jesus, uh, in the lineage in that family, of same family as Jesus. And the, the person that we're going to be talking about today is in that same line. Uh, David, King David, um, is in the line of Jesus, in that family or the lineage of Jesus. Now, I'm sure that most of you have heard about David before. Um, even if you don't go to church or you don't go very often, you've probably at least heard of a few of his stories, maybe about David and Goliath or uh, just some different stuff about David and who he was as the king. And David is actually the second most written about person in the Bible. Jesus obviously taking number one on that. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to do is just kind of walk through David's story. Now obviously we're not going to be able to cover all of his story because if we did, then we would be here till next Sunday. But uh, I do want to give just a, a few little snippets and kind of a glimpse into David's life and then from there see what we can learn. What is it about David that we can learn? So for you visual learners out there, I am a visual learner, and so I put pictures together with the little snippets of the story. This is like my inner child coming out because I love looking at pictures when I read stories. So for you who either have an inner child or you're visual learners, you're welcome. So, so David is born to a guy named Jesse. Now Jesse has eight sons in total. We don't know how many daughters he has, but he has eight sons. And David is actually the youngest of the eight sons. Now Saul at this time was king, but, but God had actually left Saul. His spirit was no longer in Saul, and God sends Samuel, who's a prophet, to go find the next king. Now God actually leads Samuel as well uh, into this house of Jesse. So Samuel gets to the house, and he's asking for the sons to come out to see who's going to be the next king. So they start with the oldest one, and it's like, no, not him. The second, no, not him. The third, no. And they go through the, the first uh, seven oldest sons. None of them. None of them were the next king. And, and so Samuel asked, uh, Samuel asked Jesse, do you have any more sons? Well, yeah, there's David, but... You don't, you don't want him. He's just a sheep guy. He just watches over the sheep. Well, they, brought, they ended up bringing David in, and, and God tells Samuel, this is the one. This is the one that I want right here. And so Samuel anoints David to become the next king. Now, let's pause here for just a second. We know that David is the youngest, David is probably the smallest, and he's probably, honestly, the least qualified person to be the next king, especially out of that family. 
But it's important what we see in 1 Samuel. This is a statement that, that God says that we're going to kind of carry throughout the rest of the message. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. So David, once he is anointed king, uh, there's a lot of waiting that takes place until he actually becomes king. Because we believe that it was about 15 years old when he was first anointed king. And then he has to wait until Saul dies. And Saul eventually dies, and it's a, he's about 30 at this time. So there's 15 years of him just waiting on the promise of God. He's just waiting, and there's a lot that happens during that waiting time. Early on, David actually plays music for Saul. Because after the spirit of the Lord left him, there's an evil spirit actually that comes into Saul. And so once David plays this music, it kind of relieves Saul from that spirit. And then there's another story in that waiting time that we're all very familiar with, the story of David and Goliath. I mean, we all know this story and it's used as an analogy for all kinds of different things. And we see that God gives David the tools that he needs to defeat his Goliath. And after David defeats Goliath, David actually starts to gain favor with a lot of the people. And Saul sees this, and at first he's kind of a little uneasy about this, about David kind of gaining popularity with the people because, hold on a second, I'm still king. And so Saul actually starts to get angry. And in his anger, Saul tries to kill David. And he spends the rest of his life, the rest of his remaining reign as king, seeking out David so that he could kill him. And David, this whole time, is fleeing from Saul. Now there's multiple times that David had the chance to kill Saul, but he didn't. David waited on the promise of of God. Now eventually Saul and David, uh, Saul and Jonathan, which is, which is uh, Saul's son, they go into battle. And during that battle, they both get killed. Jonathan actually gets killed and then uh, Saul actually falls on his sword. And it's at that moment that David becomes king. So David is now king, but he's actually only king over Judah, which is kind of the, the southernmost part of Israel. And then a few other battles kind of take place, and, and then he eventually becomes king over all of Israel. And once he's king over all of Israel, he tells God, I'm going to build you a temple that's going to blow your mind. I'm going to make sure that I build you a temple so that you can stay there. We're going to put the Ark of the Covenant, the covenant and it's going to be awesome. But God's like, no, nope, no thanks, I'm good. He says, but, but here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to actually bring you into the line of Jesus. So now everybody will know that you are part of the lineage. You are part of the family of Jesus, of the Messiah. So now as we continue to look at David's life, it wasn't all positive. right? David had some sin in his life. Uh, if you remember the story of Bathsheba, she was bathing on the roof, and I didn't want to show that picture in church. I didn't think that was appropriate. So we have Bathsheba. Bathsheba. So maybe you'll remember her name from that. I don't know. But I figured that picture wouldn't be appropriate. But uh, what we see is that, that David actually sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof, and he sends a servant over to go get her, and he sleeps with her. And then he goes even a step further than that. And he, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, uh, sends him to the front line to be killed in battle. And so not only does he have adultery, but now he's murdered her husband. And this is obviously a low point in David's life. And, and from this, we see that there's a prophet called Nathan who comes and calls out the sin in David's life. Now, when we look at the end of David's reign, he had a couple sons that had fallen into sin as well. And, and one of his sons, Absalom, is actually chasing after him at the end of his life and trying to kill David. So we see at the beginning and at the end of David's life, David is really fleeing. He's fleeing for his own life. 
Now, just from these different snippets of David's life, there's, I mean, we can see some ups and downs. It, it's almost like a roller coaster. He, he has great times with God, and it, it seems like nothing can stop him. The world is nowhere to be found because it's just him and God. And then there's other times when we see David in these valleys, and it's like, man, David, did you even, do you even know God? Do you even remember what God did for you, that, that God is the one that made you king? We see these ups and downs and these peaks and valleys in David's life. And even through the highs and lows, God still calls David a man after his own heart. We see in Acts 13, uh, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So after Saul is king, David moves in because he was a man after God's own heart. Now, as we can see from his story, David was obviously nowhere near perfect. Right? He, was, he was not even close to perfect. And, and when we see from, God's, or from David's story that a man or a woman after God's own heart isn't perfect. We're not able to be perfect. There was only one perfect person, and his name was Jesus. There's never going to be anybody that's perfect before him or never anybody after him either. So what was it about David that made him a man after God's own heart? David was focused. David was focused for the most part on doing what God has called him to do. And when David lost that focus, he repented. He turned from his sin, and he focused back in on what it was that God wanted him to do. Now, another way to say this, and this is kind of the bottom line for today, is that a person after God's heart is focused, not perfect. If you don't remember anything else, I I want you to remember this point, that a person after God's own heart is focused, not perfect. Now, for a lot of us, that that statement brings a lot of freedom, realizing that we're going to mess up. None of us are going to be perfect. It's it's not possible for us to be perfect. But with us being able to focus on God and focus on the things that he wants us to do, then we're able to be a person after God's own heart. Today, I want to spend the rest of our time focusing in and looking at the things that David did in his life and some of the things that he had in his life that made him a man after God's own heart. And what does that look like for us? How do we become a person after God's own heart? Now, this first one is is, um, kind of obvious, but without this one, I I think this this is so foundational that without this one, we can't be a person after God's own heart. We have to love God and seek his will. Love God and seek his will. When we look in scripture, it's it's amazing to be able to see how much David actually loved God. How much he not only loved God, he loved his word, he loved uh, the will of God, and he loved God's law. David loved everything about God. And the cool thing for us is that not only do we get this huge narrative where we get to see all kinds of different parts of David's story, but we also get the book of Psalms where he wrote about half of them. And so we get to see into his heart. We get to see what was going on inside of him as he's going through some of these situations. And a lot of the Psalms that he wrote were, were love Psalms, singing praises to God, praising him for what he's done. Praising him for who he is. And some of the songs were, were psalms of lament. And psalms that, that um, he just he didn't feel worthy of, of God's uh, gift. And as we saw in Acts 13, this verse that we looked at earlier, that David tried to do everything that God wanted him to do. He loved God fully, and he wanted to do God's will. Psalm 27, verse 4 gives us a little bit of a glimpse into David's love for God. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. When we look at this, this word seek here, this last word seek, 
It literally means in the Hebrew term to examine or to scrutinize. So what David is actually doing here is he's examining his life. He's, he's putting his life under tough scrutiny to say, am I in the will of God? Am I where God has called me? Am I doing what God wants me to do? So what does it look like for us to fully love God? Well, to fully love God, we have to do the things that he's asking us to do. For some of us, God is asking us to get rid of something. There's a hurt, there's a habit, there's a hang-up, there's an addiction. There's something in our life that God is asking us to get rid of, but we can't. We won't because we love that thing, whatever that is, we love that more than we love God. And God is saying, to love me fully, you have to get rid of this in your life, whatever that might be. And then there's others of us who God is calling us to have a conversation. God is calling us to do something that we feel uncomfortable with. And and we say, nope, God, I've, I've got my little comfortable bubble here. I've got people that I like to talk to. I've got things that I like to do. And don't take me outside of that. But God is saying to fully love me, you have to step outside of your comfort zone. You have to be willing to do that. Are you loving God fully? Do you actively seek the will of God? Are you examining your life to see if you are in the will of God? Now, one of the other things that we see in David's life is that he lived with great humility, which leads us to the second point. A person after God's own heart lives with humility. There are a couple different places that we see David living with humility. The the first relationship that we see is his relationship with God. And then the second we see that he lives actually with humility in his relationship with other people as well. There were multiple times when David could have taken matters into his own hands and said, you know what, God, I got this. Saul's right here in my grasp. He actually at one point cuts off part of his cloak. Saul's right here in my grasp. I could just kill him and get this all over with. We could spare like probably 10 years and I'll just be king. But instead, David humbled himself and said, God, I know that your plan is better than mine. Whatever it is that you're doing in me, whatever plan that you have for me, it's better than my plan. David knew the truth that we see all throughout scripture. David knew that James 4, 6 was true. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, humility is a thing that God has had to teach me that I hate learning. It is the worst thing to learn in I, I don't like it, but when I, when I first got out of college, I had this incredible opportunity to go to a church in Atlanta, Georgia to do a two-year pastoral residency at 12 Stone Church, and it was an absolutely incredible opportunity, a huge blessing. It's a well-known program that I got to go to, and with this blessing, uh, there, was, there was pride that started to creep in to my life. I started to to get those thoughts in my head of, look what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm working at a big church here. I am am doing great things here. And, And I started to make it all about myself. And then, uh, like only God knows how to do, he served me a big old slice of humble pie. I don't know about you, but I hate humble pie. It's my least favorite pie of all times. But part of, part of the residency is, is finding another job because they, they just don't pay you that much. And so uh, I got a job at Chick-fil-A, which I know sounds awesome, but I vowed that I would never work in food service. Humble pie slice one. Here you go, Keith. And so I worked at Chick-fil-A, and, and any time we got slow, I would have to do the things that no one else wanted to do. I had to unload the truck. I had to restock. I had to um, clean the bathrooms, which was my absolute favorite part. It was not fun. But I remember one time specifically that uh, I was cleaning the bathroom, and I I was literally on my hands and knees scrubbing the bathroom floor, and this guy came into the bathroom, 
And he was a little bit older, and he said, don't worry, man, it can only go up from here. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I, I started to think to myself, it should get better than this. I, I, I should be better than this right now because I have a bachelor's degree in ministry. God has called me into ministry, and I am working at this big church. I am, I am just in it right now. And then in the only way that God can, he whispered to me, it's not about you. Okay. It's not about you. God had to put me in a Chick-fil-A scrubbing the bathroom floor to help me realize it's not about you. Don't you hate it when, when God has to take us to messy places to teach us a lesson? It's not about us. It's not about what we want. When we look back at David's story, we see that it wasn't about him. It was about God's kingdom. It was never about him until he made it about him. But we see that he lived with humility with other people as well in those relationships. I love what Rick Warren says about humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Humility is thinking more of others. It's not that God wants us to think we are scum of the earth, we're the worst people that has ever lived. No. He wants us to know that we are a beautiful creation, fearfully and wonderfully made, but in that, it's not about us. It's not about what we want. Until we get to this place where we're able to live with humility, then God is not able to, to use us in his kingdom because it's all about our kingdom. What would it look like for us as a church? What would it look like for us as a community to live in a way that we see other people, that we serve other people, that they are the exact same as us? That we, we give other people what they need before we get what we want. I think our community, I think our town, I think our, our church would be radically different if we live with that type of humility. Now, David lost focus. There were times in his life when he just lost focus. The most blatant that we can see, obviously, is his sin with Bathsheba. And after that sin, David was called out. God sent a, a messenger and, and said, David, you've sinned, you've messed up. And what does David do from there? I'm sorry, I did. He repents. He turns away. To be a person after God's own heart, we have to learn to repent when we fail. The first two things that we, we see is that David is focused. David is focused on God. David is focused on other people. But then, when that focus is lost, he repents. We have to repent when we fail. Again, when we look at David's story, it wasn't that he didn't sin that made him a man after God's own heart. It was that he repented when he did sin. After that sin with Bathsheba, again, God sends this messenger, Nathaniel, to say, David, you've messed up. And David repents from that. He turns from that. When we fall in life, when we fail in life, when we sin in life, we lose our focus on God. So in order to refocus and revive our relationship with him, we have to repent from our sins. And repent literally means for us to turn away. We turn away from the things that we're doing and we refocus ourselves on God. We get realigned with who God is. For some of us, it's really easy to admit when we fail. For others of us, we're guys, and we don't like to admit when we're wrong. But I think for both sides, we have to learn how to repent when we fail. Repentance doesn't mean that there's not going to be any consequences from that action or that sin. Repentance doesn't even necessarily mean that there's restoration with those people, even if it is a sin with another person. Repentance means that there is restoration in our relationship with God. 
When we, when we repent and ask for, for forgiveness, we turn from our sinful ways and we focus in on who God is. Just like David, we all have times when we fail. We all have times when we sin and we have, when we have to repent. For some of us in here, we have, we have never made that first step to have a relationship with God, to repent from our sin. If that's you, if you've never had a relationship with God or, or never committed your life to him, never focused in on God, I would encourage you, I'm going to be hanging out at the stage, I would love to talk to you about what it looks like to have a relationship with him. That is the best, greatest decision that you will ever make in your entire life. Now we're going we're gonna to move into a time of communion. And if you are a believer, then you are invited but not obligated to take communion with us today. But part of communion is thanking Jesus for what he did for us on the cross. But also at the same time, we have to repent. We have to turn back from our sinful ways. And during this time of communion, if, if you have something in your life that, that you just need to repent of, you need, to, you need to go to God and say, God, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that I messed up right here. I know that, that this area of my life, I need to repent right there. But for all of us, we need to take this time to thank Jesus that he came to die on the cross so that we're able to repent. We're able to turn back and spend eternity with him. Before we take communion, I want to I'm going to read a psalm that, that David wrote after his, uh, his sin with Bathsheba. The psalm of uh, lament. And it, it just you can, you can feel the, the sorrow. And maybe this is your prayer uh, during communion. So if everyone would just close their eyes, I, I want to read this and just listen to uh, this repentant heart that David has. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to, to be in your presence today. It's so sweet. I pray, God, that we would be men and women after your own heart. That we would love you. That we would seek your will. God, and when we mess up, because we're going to, I pray that we would repent, that we would see that in our life. God, even maybe right now as we take communion, God, that you would show us where we need to repent. God, we love you so much, and we're so thankful for that sacrifice. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In your name we pray, amen. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are in Fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. David was a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, because he was focused. He was focused in on loving God, seeking his will, living with humility, and when he didn't, he repented. Would you be considered, would, would God consider you a man or a woman after his own heart? If someone else came up to you, would they consider you a man or a woman after God's own heart? So my challenge for us today, let's love God. Let's seek his will. Let's live with humility, and when we fail because we're going to, Let's repent. Let's turn from that. God, thank you. Thank you for being so gracious to us. That when we fail, when we mess up, God, that you are there for us. 
I pray that this week, God, we would love you, that we would seek after your will. God, we would live with humility, and God, when we mess up, that we wouldn't be afraid to repent. I pray that, God, as we, as we give you our tithes and our offerings, and as we give back to you, God, that you would bless that. God, that, that we would love you through this part of the service as well. In your name we pray, amen.